we all have certain quietly held fears, things that we worry about. It could be so completely unrealistic to imagine that it could really ever happen. I think that's why the movie Final Destination was so popular, because it presented us in grand cinematic scale with the fragility of life. I found myself in a situation that reminded me ever so gently of my mortality and of how anything at any moment can go left or right. Except I was really lucky to have a helper, a guide by my side. After the pandemic, I made myself a lot of promises. The pandemic for me coincided with a dark night of the soul, a tower moment, the loss of a long-term relationship, betrayal, the discovery of covert narcissism in my camp, the closest person to me. It was a telenovela, if ever there were. I spent a month on the couch, as we do, I spent a month spoon deep in the Hagen dazs for me, maybe Ben and Jerry's for you. I spent a lot of time writing and working and figuring out who I was going to be, how much I did or didn't like my spouse. What exactly do you do during a quarantine? And then that heartbreak and the subsequent healing rolled into an autoimmune issue that consumed me because I had been consumed by narcissistic energy. Now, psychologists, doctors, coaches, teachers talk about the direct link to autoimmune issues and the empath. But as many things in my life happen, I figured it out fast and a little bit ahead of the curve. I got sick, really sick, and I really had to examine my own self-worth. How did I end up here? So for years, I was dictated to by the news, by the CDC, by the doctors that were taking care of me, what I could and couldn't do. Everyone had an idea, my spouse, my mother, well-meaning friends and family too. And the promises that I made for myself is that when I could go, when I could escape, when I could travel, when I could fly, that I would do everything that I'd ever dreamt to do. 2023 is when the year where so many dreams have come true. You know, we create our tomorrows by what we dream about today. And so in the fog and the haze of illness and heartbreak and reconciliation with myself and discovery and coming into the best part of me through the worst parts of me, I said, I will touch every corner of this globe. I'm no longer waiting for it to be right or for a partnership to support what it is that I want. I decided I wanted to not only be free, but that I was going to set myself free. I'd spent a lot of years, like we do empaths, emashed and steeped in codependency and thinking that the dream that I wanted to have had to be attached to someone that was beside me. And my angels repeatedly showed me that that was not going to happen. They were waiting to see if I would choose me. Whether it was super toxic or halfway not at all toxic or completely well-meaning, I had a lot of ideas of what I should be doing in my life. But it was like when this happens, and not always attached to another person, but an ideology, 
or a way that I my body should be. I was depriving myself of living this life. And when I got to the reality and brought to my knees with the autoimmune disease, I realized, oh, you have to be Tim McGraw and live like you were dying in his song. It was modeled by my sister, who is battling stage four colon cancer. It was modeled by my father, who passed away from the same disease. Life is not promise. Life is not infinitesimal. We are here like a wind and a breeze. And so I said, if I can get out of this bed, and if it doesn't hurt to sit, stand, or walk every single day in the most excruciating way, I'm going to go. But that means I also had to face other fears that I didn't even yet know. My sister once said to me something that shifted the way that I manifested. The thing you want is wanting you. I had these really staunch ideas of how I could make my dreams come true. I'm good at manifesting. I'm good at bringing things to fruition. But I wasn't listening to the magic that life can take and the way that our angels and ancestors work with us for literally goodness sake. We can have anything we want in any configuration, even the things that aren't the best for us, because it's free will. That is our human station, free will. The thing you want is wanting you. So I unapologetically, unabashedly, no matter what anybody said around me, decided I'm going to make every single dream come true. I'm going to take every trip. I'm going to go to everything. I'm going to go to every concert. I'm going to live every dream. I'm going to do things that people that know me would say, ah, Mona, I wouldn't normally do this. This isn't like you, sis. But it is like me, the me that I suppressed, the me that was told no, the me that had the trips canceled because the CDC said so, the me that was told you will be bedridden and bed rested and you will not get up, the me that had spouses <laughs> that uh, spoke into my life that would rather that I was just a homebody. I had so many things that I was kind of like waking up out of the coma and ripping off of me because my life was potentially not going to be as long as I thought when I was in the fog before diagnoses and realizations. And I thought, oh my gosh, is my sister diagnosis my diagnosis too? Will I go the way of my father with 30 plus years cut off of my life prematurely? These are choices that can be made. And some choices I thought might be made for me as I land operating tables with men in white suits saying words like emergency. That changed the way that I decided to live. So whatever fears that I had harbored within me had to give, they had to give way. Over the weekend, I found myself at a concert. And the concert was fine. It was great. It's something I intentionally wanted to do. And I was really happy to be there. And at the end of it, it was time to go. And my guide, my friend that I was with, said so. But it was so quick. We communicate in all kinds of ways as humans, and she and I communicate in all kinds of ways, too. She just looked at me, and she was like, are you ready? She is an avid concert goer, so this is not her first rodeo by a mile, and not my first one either, but um, I'm pretty much a novice, very new compared to her. And so I knew what she meant. It hadn't been discussed previously. We didn't have a game plan. You know, the drinks were flowing, so I was pretty tipsy, very buzzy, feeling good. We were on Coney Island at the Coney Island Amphitheater. And she looked at me as the last song was winding down, his most famous song, Calm Down. Baby, calm down, calm down. 
you guys have heard it. It was everywhere. And he did a remix with Selena Gomez as well. His name is Rama. So, Rama, Rima, Rama. <laughs> In any case, Rama, I believe. Um, Afro beats and just a good time. And a Vic Tony was there with one of my favorite songs, Holy Father. To hear that in person, I started the year with that song. And it blew my mind open because I thought, if this is not the most perfect convergence of gospel and falling in love, I don't know what is. Because uh, coming from Pentecostal church and hearing all that music all the time, I loved the idea <laughs> that this point of ecstasy and point of realization and point of surrender, because I think that's what love is, is surrender, where you just are like, there's a line in the song where he's like, Chew me up, spit me out, make me stand on my feet. I surrender to this. Do what you want with me. Though those sentiments are paralleled with religious ecstasy as well as with romantic ecstasy. And I don't mean sexually. I mean the idea of giving into the chemistry of a connection. And I just didn't even understand why it was so important. And when I listened to it, Holy Father, <laughs> yeah, my Lady Gaga's got me in my feelings. Being a member of the LGBTQIA, the Ligibitqua, I just heard someone saying that earlier, it was hilarious, um, the eligibility community, <laughs> I have related to having a Lady Gaga definitely have me in my feelings before. So, I loved the song. I thought it was so brilliantly encapsulated. And to get to hear him sing it, Mayor Khan and Vic Tony both sing the song, but to get to hear him sing it on stage, I was delighted. Delighted to scream that at the top of my lungs. But anyway, the concert is over. And it was all orchestrated by the angels because that wasn't a plane. It wasn't like, I'm following this guy, I like this music, and I'm going to hear this song live. It was just a lovely bonus and it started at the beginning of the year and they played the song so much it's so funny they played the song so much that it was soothing to me at the beginning of the year then I stopped listening to it and then it picked up again life has a funny way but anyway the song is over calm down the last song plays he sings us out she looks at me and she says are you ready and so much was communicated in that moment because we needed to get out the parking lot where our car was at closed within 30 minutes and you had to pay $100 if you were parked overnight to get your car out and it was a whole thing. I'm a little tipsy, maybe she was too, and we start pushing through the crowd. Now I started this saying, we all have fears in life, right? My final destination fear is to be like tripped in a crowd and then like I fall and then get trampled. And I know that it's not too far out because we see that happen at concerts. Think of Travis Scott uh, and his Astro World, World Tour in the last year. It happens all the time. People in large masses with a lot of liquor and a lot of weed at the end of the night, because that whole place was like a puff cloud, certainly, um, aren't always thinking clearly, to say the least. And in the mad push to escape, we all, and I say escape, I mean, there was no gunshots, uh, thankfully there was no drama, but it was the end of the night and everybody's trying to get out, so they're not paying that parking fee if they park there, or get out to get on with their life and back into the freshest of air, even though we were in an amphitheater. So, she says that to me, are you ready? And we start to push through, and people are fighting, and I'm hearing, like, fights break out, like, guys are pushing, you push me, you push me, you push me, and, like, someone's girl was, like, grab me, she grabbed me, do something about it. It's like life, it's like life on steroids is happening, and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and I'm freaking out, and before I could say anything, uh, again, my friend and I have telepathic communication at times, um... And before I could even say anything, I felt her hand. She was in front of me, kind of like reach back through the crowd as I was trying to make my way through. And she grabbed my hand and she didn't let go until we made it outside around the pole, up the ramp, down the stairs, down through concession and through the doors that we originally came in through the VIP area and out to the sidewalk and even for a little way longer. And I didn't feel so concerned and so worried about getting lost and spending unnecessary time trying to find her or reconnect or being 
pushed down and trampled my final destination moment. And it was not a lot of communication because in moments like that, you don't have time to do it. I understood what she meant when she said, are you ready? It was almost like getting ready to run with the bulls. She'd be like, are you ready? <laughs> Again, that wasn't our experience at the last concert that we went to. It was far more tame. This one was a little bit more rowdy because everybody was, it was a different kind of crowd and a different kind of energy for sure, right? And I so appreciated that because she did not know that that was a fear for me. I did not communicate that with her because I didn't even think about it. Sometimes we have these subconscious and my favorite word as of late, subterranean things that are deeply hidden. And so I didn't say, hey, hey, girl, hey, you need to know this. But her angel said it to her and she didn't let go until we were safe. She didn't make me feel bad for not being as fast as her. Because if she wanted to, she could have sprinted out of there. She didn't make me feel bad when after we sprinted out of there, I said, okay, girl, give me 20 seconds. (laughs) Let me catch my breath. And then we sojourned on to our car in the parking lot. We laughed and we talked and walked the rest of the way much more calmly. But I was so grateful for that moment and her protection of me because that's what it was. Whether she understood it or not, I did. And it made me think about the people that are sent in to guide us. And sometimes you don't get to have long, extensive conversations with them. And they don't get to explain why they've been sent in or dispatched as an earth angel for you or a helper or a friend or a fairy or whatever. But you have to trust them. And... She didn't know that she was doing a great service for me, which was making sure that I got out and that I wasn't on my knees (laughs) grappling around trying to find my stuff or get my bearings as the crowd crushed in on me, which was my great fear. People to help you are near is the message for today. I've been really doing some deep study and taking time. For me, I've been doing what I tell you guys to do, which is juicing up my sacral energy, which is about pleasure, meaning travel, interesting things to look at. I can't wait to share all of it with you. Um, Interesting things to take in. Uh, Definitely working with my clients as I do, no matter where I am. God bless the clients that are listening who were patient with me as I was like living in an airport one day like Tom Hanks with multiple cancellations and I was reading from the airport, which I often do anyway. If, if you if you work with me, you know that we've probably read from an airport at some point because I stay in them quite frequently, but that has a lot to do with the promises that I made when I was in bed and I could barely breathe from COVID or sit up from surgery. So... For years, I felt like I was down, you know, and every time I go, my husband is like, I thought you said you were going to take a break because that's what a homebody would say because home is safe for him and comforting, but I have a wanderlust and I love traveling and I could never fully explain or articulate to him, though I've tried how terrible it was to be bedridden and to not be able to be independent and go and do because that brings me so much life and then I can bring things to you. So I've been taking every opportunity because, you know, even in the next couple of hours, I've got to get ready because I meet with a new surgeon and I have been taking advantage of every second that I'm not laid out on a table and getting operated on because it takes months to recover and I'm just not as strong. And those surgeons are people that are sent in to help me and I'm grateful and I get it and I see. But I want you guys to think about who's sent in to help you spiritually. Who is the hand that reaches back in the crowd that says, hold on? It was simple. But it was my most memorable thing about, well, there are a lot of really cool things that happened on the trip, but that was a really memorable moment for me because it sounds dramatic, but she saved my life in a way, okay? Nothing was happening. I wasn't in danger, but 
I was feeling closed in and claustrophobic and unsure and in a new space. And when we finally got outside and the salt water from the Coney Island shore hit my face and sobered up my senses and we were under street lights and she said, are you sure you're okay? Before she even would let go of my hand, she was like, are you good? I'm good. I'm okay. Ask yourself who's sent in to spiritually help you. It may just be a quick moment. It may just be something that someone is guided to do. And also, ask yourself, are you willing to take their help? I didn't have to grab her hand. I could have been like, I'm good, sis. I'll push through the crowd. But I knew that us as a train moving through, as a unit, was going to be far more powerful than us moving singly. In that moment, in that crush, in that insanity, post-concert. And it worked. I didn't have to tell her my uh, final destination fear. I chatted with her about it subsequently. And I thanked her because I was greatly appreciative of her being compassionate. That's a word that I feel like was extended to me, a lot of compassion in that moment. And I know it's just basic rules, no friend left behind, all of that. But even in my visit, because of life and because of all the things I've had to readjust and relearn and recover from, I had to thank that friend for the kind way she went out of her way to accommodate me in many little tiny instances so very thoughtfully because I'm always anticipating how my body has changed and what ways it could affect whomever I'm traveling with and I could find myself apologizing profusely or feeling bad or guilty hashtag the empath still resides in me and I didn't feel the need at least in this trip to do that because she was so lovely to anticipate little things that I may need or that uh, how I could feel and if I needed a minute. Just little things. And my angels talked to me about it and they said, this is what it's like when real help is given and when someone really cares about you. They're not going to make you feel guilty about your inadequacies or the things you can and can't do. A spiritual helper of any kind that day she was my my uh, hand holder to get out of the concert. But a spiritual helper of any kind will treat you that way. And it made me think of other relationship dynamics that I had that brought me to my tower moment and had me fall on my face. And I thought about how hard I clamored to keep relationships with people that never would have treated me with a modicum of the compassion that I was treated with by someone who has not known me near as long and is not near as invested as that other relationship could have or should have been. So that's another message as I was taking notes about this week and about my experience. It wasn't so much about what was happening there, boots on the ground, other than a lovely time. It was about how I have a beautiful bestie and I have other friendship support dynamics and I have this support dynamic that I'm speaking about from the concert time and they're so lovely. All of these people are so compassionate and so kind to me and go out of their way to anticipate my needs and you know, things where I would push myself specifically with this, with this friend for this week. And she would say, don't you think you want to like lay down and take a nap? Like I'd say, I'll go with you to come do whatever the errand is. And she was like, you know, maybe, maybe I'm going to take you back to your place and you go take a nap because yeah, she's like, she said something to me and it kind of caught my chest. She was like, I don't even think you realize that you're tired. And I didn't, I was, I had, I'd even said it to her the day before I already you know, thought in my mind, this is going to be a long day. We're going to be up early. We're doing this, 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 and this. So many magical things happened that day and we got to get it all done. And so I'm just building it in that it's going to be a long day. Uh, my Leo self will definitely burn the candle candle at both ends, but this person specifically has been dispatched into my life and she's all about rest. Interestingly fun too, but she builds in rest for me in ways that I've never had a friend do. Like, she literally is like, no, 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 you need to lay down, you know? 
and she means it, and there's follow through with it. And instead of her being like, yeah, sure, come with me while I do the three things that I got to do, she's like, take a nap, and I'll come back, and I'll visit with you. And she did. <laughs> and when I woke up, she was walking in the apartment, and I was like, oh, it's you. And I was like, I'm so glad I rested, actually. I was exhausted. I didn't even realize it. And she was like, I knew. Think about the people that are dispatched around you. Do they know who you are? Are they taking into consideration what your needs are? Think about the relationships that you thought you couldn't live without, maybe that you've extracted yourself from, the ones that were not serving you well, the ones that you would have killed for, the ones where you were like, I would do anything to keep this because this is my person. I think about how inconsiderate that person was. That she did not give a damn about me at all. And it makes me so sad that I didn't see that. I'm not in mourning over it at all, girl. We don't heal. We good. <laughs> you move on. You are sent new people. And you move on. And you really do. And that's something I want to tell anybody that's in the throes of extracting themselves from a toxic, abusive relationship. Or someone that didn't care about you or take care of you as a partner, a friend, a lover, whatever you were to them. God, there is so much better. I, I can't say enough about the levels of compassion that have been extended to me, whether it's for my in-laws, taking into account dietary needs. Uh, you guys know I'm gluten-free. Um, or to this friend who also does the things like that that just freaking blow my mind, the level of sweetness and thoughtfulness that she put into some of the moments that we had and shared that were geared solely for me, treated me so beautifully. Or to my bestie who does the very same and is above and beyond in so many ways more than I could ever name you can go watch the bestie video where we're chatting about our relationship and hear directly from her mouth too but I have these beautiful connections in my life and relationships with people my niece and my nephew who reach out hey Aunt Monette are you okay they're in their 30s thinking about you today they send me flowers my bestie I feel sends me flowers I feel loved and I'm not just saying that to wave it in your face. I'm saying this is a treatment that we deserve, that we give, and that we deserve to have reciprocated. You know, lack of reciprocity, unrequited, these were my trigger words. And my angels have been juicily loving on me through perfect strangers that will come up to me right down to my bestie, right down to magical fairies. I feel loved. And I realized how loved I didn't feel in those other connections. You know, a lot of people from your past would like to have you back, guys. Do you know that? They would like to have access to you again. They would like to siphon your energy. They'd like to drink from your cup. If you had a sexual relationship, they'd like to exchange sexual energy with you and engage in sex magic. And what I mean by that is, like, take your life force a lot of people from your past, maybe you cut off family members, blood relatives that didn't believe you and that threw you to the wolves. They would love to have the access that they once had to you before you were the new empowered you. And they have this weird sick fantasy, I feel led to tell you as I'm channeling this, that you're going to come back to them someday or that you're going to fall on hard times and you'll look back their way. Well, I had hard times and I don't tempt fate because I know that we plan and God certainly laughs. But I've had hard times. And at my lowest point, with parts of my body being removed, with with heartbreak that just was so crippling I couldn't breathe. I, and it wasn't the heartbreak. It was the betrayal that crippled me. Because we empath love so totally and so free. Also, we have good intuition. So if we gaslight ourselves because we're being gaslit and we truly don't see, we beat ourselves up doubly. Raise your hand if you can relate, right? Like, how did I miss that? Well, I remember being as low as I could be and I would never go back to some of the exes or some of the old friends that have tried to spin the block and hoover me um, since I have changed. Since their betrayals caused me to have to change. Because I think about how badly they treated me. And I think about how much better they could have done and how much better they did do for other people that they did value. 
and I realize what it is like to be loved by people that don't even know you though that well, that you haven't even spent that much time with. I've been treated better by perfect strangers on the street than the person that I was dedicating that much of my time and energy to. So if you're reminiscing about the good old days and maybe it's a fresh breakup and you've weirdly found my channel and you're like, I want them back. Think about how they treated you and think about how you deserve to be treated and think about the treatment that you give to others. The little thoughtful things that you do, the ways that you maybe read someone's mind and read that they're in fear as my fairy friend did. She knew. And she also maybe just wanted to go. Maybe it wasn't even that deep for her. Maybe there was just an instinct like, yeah, we got to get out of here. It could have been that simple. But the care that she extended to me in those moments, <laughs> as we're running through the crowd just as fast as we can, <laughs> very much Debbie, uh, Debbie, I don't know who that is. It's Debbie, but it's from the 80s. Remember she had on the jacket? But it was running just as fast as we can, holding onto one another's hand, hand, trying to get away into the night. There's more to the song, but that's how I felt. It was like, it was like a video. It was very much giving MTV video back in the 90s, you know? And we were at the beach, too. I think she ends up at the beach in that video as well. But that part, it was like running through the crowds, or quickly walking. <laughs> Not running, really. But quickly walking through the crowds. And it was just a moment where I felt so very loved and protected and cared for. I was like, girl, if I was with myself, this would have been a shenanigan. Or I would have just waited till the crowds cleared out and then been like, damn, why is my car locked up, <laughs> right? So, think about the people that are dispatched and don't dwell too much in the past about what you had and what you lost. Come on, Fleetwood Mac. What you had and what you lost. Players only love you when they're playing. And thunder only happens when it's raining, guys. You have to let go of that past. I was never... <laughs> the epiphany I had in this last trip, when I had these searingly incredible moments of happiness that didn't come from any particular thing. I just was feeling waves of healing. And as I was feeling that, I realized I was never happy with my other connection. She made me unhappy as just a matter of fact and a way of life because she was quite the depressive, quite the Eeyore. And I thought, why did I like her so much? And not in a contemptuous, like, oh, I just lost a dead weight and I can do better. I've been through all those stages. The videos are here to prove it. But this was a different feeling. This wasn't, there wasn't any bitterness attached to it. It was just like a realization of delusion on my end. I wasn't mad at her. She was put in my life dispatched to do exactly what she did. To treat me as terribly as she did. To think that I deserve to be treated that way. And you say, how dare she, right? But hold that mirror up to yourself as I had to. And look right into that light. And realize that that's the way that I treated me. And it was just reflected back to me. As it has in your life been reflected back to you. There was some part of me that thought I deserved that. That I deserved her mediocre, less than middling less than mediocre, actually, subpar attempts at friending me, whatever that means. Playing mind games with me because it was Tuesday and it was fun, of trying to put me in competitions, of which just me existing in them means I had already won, <laughs> quiet as it's kept, loud as it's whispered. But they thought so and they thought differently. Life has now shown them everything they need to see. You know, don't take up arms sometimes when you're dealing with the current people in your life or the narcissistic exes or ex-friends or family members. Re Beyonce said it best and she never lied. Best revenge is your paper. It's not about money. It's about your success. And I don't just mean your achievements. I'm talking about your personal piece of success. The fact that you have a meditation routine. The fact that you are spiritually connected. The fact that you have created a beautiful life in spite of all the evil eye and negativity and hateration and holleration and ill wishes that people sent your way. The fact that you crawled out of things that they couldn't on their freaking best day. That is really where you stand and where you win. I think about what was given to me. And now I know what's been given to them. And yes, 
I feel grateful that karma has served its purpose. We can never out karma karma. I didn't get down and dirty. I don't know who this is for today. I didn't get in the trenches. I didn't go tit for tat. I realized I was in spiritual warfare. I realized I was under attack. And then I started to strategize. And my angel said, you will live in such a beautiful way. You will not die on this day. You will die another day, but it will not be on this day. It will not be in this dark night. So whoever is listening, this is not your way you go. This is not your final destination ending, and that's what you need to know. The crowds are not going to crush in and trample you. There is a hand that's coming through proverbially or actually that's saying, are you ready to go? Are you ready to get out of the mayhem and the mess? Are you ready to leave the debauchery behind? Are you ready to leave the toxic ex? Are you ready to distance yourself from the low vibrational family members that don't like that you're up next? Are you ready to ascend and climb and divorce yourself from indoctrination and patriarchy? Are you ready to be the divine feminine that you always have been and that you are being called to be? The hand is out. It could be my words today. It could be something else you see. It could be a billboard. It could be those seven sevens across the license plate. It could be the 222 or the 111. It could be a yellow light that reminds you to slow down. It could be the green that enhances heart chakra and makes you see love and abundance all around. It could be that visceral orange, which I saw everywhere this week. That orange color. Someone left a scarf <laughs> full of life, a tattoo fairy, different person left a scarf and it was orange next to me. And in everything I watched and in everything I saw, that orange color came because that's what my angels were working on to get me back into frame. You know, I think I was sharing ideas with someone recently. Shout out to you, my grounding root chakra sister. We'll be doing some work together soon. And she was talking about getting back into balance with her um, chakras and how it's not a linear, like you don't have to go step by step by step. Different chakras will call you to enhance and be worked on. So it might be your solar plexus and it could be your crown chakra and then it could be your throat chakra and then it could be your root. And sometimes because we like order and humans, we like to categorize things. We might think we need to go bling, 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 bling. But we get called to work on different things. For me this year, it's been root and sacral for sure. Grounding and healing and, and sacral pleasure and, and fun and remembering that life is not done. But I want you to think back when life felt done, when relationships weren't fair, when someone wasn't treating you even close to how you deserved with kindness and care. When I say thank you to the new people in my life, to the bestie in my life, to the spouse in my life, for the care that they do give, they may feel like it could be over the top, like, of course I want to do this for you, they say to me. I love you, or I care about you, or I appreciate you, or whatever they say. But I am so deeply grateful because I know that's not the way that I was treated day to day by many people. But I fell in love with me. And guys, as cliche as it sounds, it is not a secret I will keep. It is not a gate I will guard. You have to love you. And that part can be hard. I was like, you know, it'd be easy to be like, it's so easy, guys. No, it's a commitment that you make yourself to yourself every day. It's a commitment to boundaries. It's a commitment to sleep. It's a commitment to drink water. It's a commitment to release. It's a commitment that you make. That's what loving yourself looks like. And now the world says to me, there isn't a day that goes by that the world whether it's a dispatched little soul, whether it's a stranger in an airport, whether it is a dear friend, whether it is a new fairy, whether it is a tattoo fairy, whether I'm dealing with mermaids, there isn't a day that doesn't go by. To some degree, a client that I get to meet, I value what you bring to me, is what's said. I see you. I thank you. I love you. I can say confidently that... A lot of the world responds well and loves me, but it's because I spent a lot of time saying confidently that a lot of Monette responds well and loves her. And that's something I want you guys to feel and know about yourselves. 
is that in order to have that mirrored back to you, it has to be true. The universe is no respecter of persons. If you don't love you, it will be shown. It doesn't mean you deserve the toxic spouse, but it means that a backbone had to be grown and you had to choose you. Even if you miss them, even if the codependency was delicious and you thought, I can never untangle myself from this. I remember saying to that crazy person all those years ago who was just assigned to treat me badly so that I would grow. It's so beautiful to be able to look at it that way. With no hate in my heart, I forgive her completely. She did such an incredible job. I know it was done with malice and with no integrity, but she was one of the best teachers I ever had in my life because she was so incredibly mean to me. I had to love me. I had no choice. I had put all my eggs in that basket. She was a person I was going to bless. She was a person I was going to travel the world with. She was a person that I would make rich if I got rich. She was everything. And they said, no, Monat, you are everything. Put that kind of energy into you and watch what we do. But who am I going to bless? They said, we'll send new people to you. But who am I going to travel with? They said, we'll send you a friend or two. But where, who am I going to have these new experiences with and spiritual conversations with? They said, don't worry, we'll take care of that too. But it all starts with loving just you. When I think back to how unabashedly, how freely she was toxic and terrible... I realize how much work I had to do. I realize that everybody serves a purpose, even the people that are the meanest to you. And I realize that I had to go through that because now I am in gratitude for every compliment, for every kindness, for every act of compassion that is extended to me. I am not entitled. I do not take it in greedily. I know that there, but for the grace of God and a moment in time, it could all evaporate from me. So I live the golden rule and I do unto others as I would have them do unto me. And I even did unto those others that treated me so badly. I treated them beautifully in the dismount, in the discard on my end, in the removal of my energy from them. I love them even in my exit because I thought were it ever to be flipped, and were I to be the villain in someone's story, I'd want them to be able to say, Monette was fair with me. That if I hate her, and I feel like she treated me badly, that there are moments that I can say she had compassion. I didn't do, my mother always taught me that you don't do for do, meaning you don't do something to or for someone to get it back from them, because very often you will not. But what I'm getting back now in dividends, that hand in the crowd. Are you ready? Are we good? Let's go. The compassionate, kind words from strangers, the love that is sewn into me from Bestie, the kindness from my mother, and from other people that I get to meet, other family members who say, I look into my eyes and say, I appreciate and love you. I can't believe people are this mean to you. The reason I'm getting that is because I gave it even to someone who never deserved for me to. She deserved none of my kindness. She's more mean than I will probably... My angels protect me to this day. They said we would never even let you know the fullness of it because you don't deserve to be in that kind of pain. We let her be in that kind of pain. She knows how horrible she was. I'm so loved and protected and so are you. So even if you're exiting from someone, do it with as much integrity as you can muster up. Do the best you can do, because I promise you, it will be given back to you. Pressed down and shaken over. That's biblical, but it's the truth. It's the absolute truth. I'm treated the way I am today in ways that you just heard that throat crack. I still am in disbelief at how kind and complimentary people are. I don't, I don't even... You know, it's Leo's toxic trait that we certainly love attention. But I wish that you guys could get a snapshot into the other end of the spectrum of what life looked like for me. So while I may get <laughs> some attention, let me tell you something. There isn't a day that goes by that I'm not grateful 
for the kindnesses shown because I have been treated so differently. And I know a lot of you know too that you have been treated differently too. Be kind to those, even the ones that are hating you. It can be a forgive them, Father, for they know that what, not what they do. I hear some of you saying, fuck that, I'm on it. <laughs> I'm on forgiving shit. That's fine. Those are called the stages of grief, sweet friend. You'll get through it. But I promise you, the place that I'm in today, that ex of mine could walk in front of my face and I would have nothing but compassion for her. We would not be friends. I would not let her near my energy. I know exactly how precious my energy is. I know how it enhances the lives of the people that I love. If I love you, to be loved by one of us, guys, is a blessing, yeah? It's one of my favorite uh, lines from a song. I believe it's Little Baby. There's so many Little Babies, so it's hard to keep up. But I think it's Baby. Is it Baby? Little Baby? One of the babies. But he says, I'm that guy. Don't miss your blessing. Wow, Monette, that's really cocky. That's really peacocky. Yeah, he's a rapper. They're braggadocious. But the thing about being connected to empathic energy or anybody that's doing their spiritual work and taking self-accountability is that we bring good, juicy energy into people's lives. And don't you match up with someone who has like energy like you. Y'all can accelerate. Talk about power couple. That's real power coupling. Because when you get together with someone else who's like you, a hybrid, <laughs> you get together with someone else who's like, you know, think of like the X-Men. You get to, some, get to get together with someone else who has your own scarring or, or similar wounding, not just trauma bonding, but someone who has been through similar trenches to a certain degree and then transmuted that before they came to you, not codependency. They healed before they knew you. You guys are brought together. Boom. It's an acceleration. It's magic. It's absolute alchemy, literally magic. You change the lives around you and you have assignments to do. That's the soulmate energy that comes to you after you've healed. But that other person was a soulmate too. Toxic as she was, as ungrateful, what an ingrate. I, I, I say this because maybe you need to hear it or maybe I need to say it. This could just be purely cathartic today. I'd like to think that when I speak that someone takes something out of it because that is my mission on earth is to teach. But I think about how she went out of her way to ruin vacations. And I think about how much I've traveled in the last year and how much the people that I've traveled with have gone out of their way to enhance every vacation and every meetup and every time we got together. From having little sweet things for me that were gluten-free when I arrived to thoughtful things for my bestie, you know, like I just can't, there's not enough time to really say all of the things to, you know, <laughs> one of my clients that you guys have met, Dr. Mona Jones, um, made me a hummingbird cake. Hummingbird cake is like my favorite cake. She made it gluten-free. Like we had a whole fiasco about it. Flour was sent. She bought flour. We were cross-comparing ratios. She was hilarious. It was the cutest thing. She's so Southern. I'm a Mona. And uh, I sent her a like, gluten-free cake mix because I was like, okay, you should be able to make it with this. She's like, well, honey, what kind of flour is it? She said, I need that white flour. I cannot make your cake with a pre-made cake mix. I'm going to put sugar in it and baking soda and baking powder. It was the sweetest thing. I feel so juicily loved. I feel like I get energetic hugs and she, I might even post a picture of it on my community page, brings this mountain of the most gorgeous cake to me. Filled with all of my favorite delicious things. And it was gluten-free. Made with love. And she wouldn't even take the shortcut that I was trying to send. She was like, honey, I just bought some white gluten-free one-to-one ratio. Because I just could never make a pre-box. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe that someone loves me so much that they would take the, they won't take the shortcut. Let me tell you about that ex, right? <laughs> it's like a comedy show at this point. She would, cut, she would cut the short. <laughs> she would take a shorter cut if she could. I think about all the sabotaging on the shortest cut is what, what I was trying to say on the vacations and stuff. If she didn't get her way or if she couldn't access my sexual energy or whatever without talking to me, without consent, because I'm a big talker, y'all. If she couldn't get what she wanted out of me, she would ruin everything. She would leave early without explanation, repeatedly. It wasn't like one time it happened. She did it. It was like her go-to. If she couldn't escape and we were on a cruise, she would just not talk to me. It would just be the silent treatment. 
and and I would have to break the ice. You know how narcissists love for you to come to them? So I would have to be like, you realize you do this, right? And it was because I had her best interest in heart, but she didn't feel that way. And then she'd try to triangulate me. She was such a bloody nightmare, but I'm grateful I experienced it because I think of how lovely the humans that are around me now treat me. And I'm like, oh my God, what was I? Y'all, it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed. I know I documented it. It's here for people to listen to, but I'm embarrassed at the way that I allow. Like, girl, the way that I would drop kick this bee today, <laughs> she's so lucky and I'm so lucky that it did not go down that way. I would never allow or tolerate to be treated the way that I was treated, but I needed to have that cross comparison and that juxtaposition. And so now someone might be like, oh, Mona, you're overreacting at whatever little thing they think they did, quote unquote, little thing. They might, they might say it's a little thing to me. It's everything. Cause I know what it's like to have less than nothing from an ingrate, right? That part. So use those moments in your life to cross compare not to triangulate your new person when I say thank you to whoever is loving on me it's just a heartfelt thank you I don't drag them through the trauma bond of whatever else was going on um but I know in my mind how wrong the wrong was and how right their right is and I know that it's a gift and I am grateful infinitely Treat people well, guys, and you will live to see them treat you. The world will treat you well, even if it's not from the person that you did that to. Also, look for the hand that's coming out to help you, to assist you, to say, are you ready? To kind of read your mind and a fear that you may never have ever vocalized and to pull you through what could potentially be an anxiety moment for you. We are sent in to love on people. We are sent in to help in all the archetypes, whether you are a king, a queen, a teacher, a fairy, a mermaid, no matter who and what you are, you have a tribe. You have people to connect with. You have soulmates. It's not always about being, you know, romantic. It's not always about blood family. Sometimes you're making new family with new people. It's not always about being, um, sometimes it is the opposite side. It's not always about being platonic either. Whatever it is that you're seeking, because I, I counsel a lot of you guys that got out of relationships that have that question, like, oh my God, will I ever have romance again? You absolutely will. I got off track, but that was something I was going to say. I remember saying to my ex as I was dismounting, and I realized how spiteful she had been. Like, my angels removed the veil, and I started to see the narcissist mass fall, and I was like, oh my God, you did all of this on purpose? I just was gobsmacked, because I couldn't even imagine being so malicious to someone. We don't have that in us, empath. It doesn't mean that we can't be mean or bitches, because certainly we can be, and I advise highly you lean into that Queen of Swords energy for survival, and you will. You will not need to be instructed to do it. When you are going through a dark night, you will turn into a bitch unapologetically you will set a bitch fire to protect yourself because it is put in us purposely but I remember saying to her because I still hadn't fully grasped how 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 uh what's the word willful she was it was just dawning on me I was like I I, you've been happy and you know essentially it would be called grooming a new supply and all that stuff but but let's say she wasn't a complete psychopath she was falling in love or falling in lust or falling in limerence with a new person and she had all these butterflies and all of that stuff and she just wanted me to stay there because she wanted to siphon off of my energy my energy was creative my energy helped her make money my energy was responsible for regulating her her uh mental illness and personality i'm just it is what it is take credit (laughs) where credit is due and i wouldn't say this to you guys if i wasn't physically preparing to go see a surgeon to continuously correct the ramifications of being connected to an energy vampire and a narcissist okay so this is this i have empirical evidence it's in my body about how much i was giving her energy so much so that i physically destroyed my own body that's something that we do we're we are x-men in a way spiritually okay and unfortunately we will destroy ourselves we can be wolverine on ourselves because we love someone else so much that we will out give so loving yourself matters because when you love yourself you'll never give to someone else before 
before you take care of you. You're not going to pay someone else's bills if yours aren't paid. You're not going to, you see what I mean? Things were out of order, certainly. But I remember her being happy and in love and having butterflies. And butterflies were a thing that we would talk about. Um, not in a, like, I love butterflies in a natural way. That's just a thing. But I'm talking about butterflies in your stomach when you're falling in love. Chemistry, right? That's the word. And she called them butterflies for her. She was like, you know? And I was like, I can't believe you wanted me to be deprived of butterflies. Because she just wanted me to be stagnant and in the relationship with her because I was an excellent supply and source. I was like a generator for her of energy and that she couldn't generate herself. Narcissists have no creative spark. They don't have the ability to create anything or do anything. They're sucking your idea they're stealing from you and all that stuff right so without me there her life wasn't as magical and wouldn't be and I knew that I but I still was in denial about it but the part that really pissed me off and the part that you know what people ask me a lot of questions like what what made you really leave and this is that well what really pissed me off is that she didn't want me to have butterflies that she didn't want me to have new friends she didn't want me to have new love or a new lover or new limerence and to feel happy chemistry and and emotion and and serotonin and oxytocin and, and all of the best parts of a relationship where it's like, I want to take your clothes off, I want to take my clothes off, I want to take our clothes off. Like, everybody's clothes are coming off. You got a car, right? She wanted all of that for herself because she was such a narcissist, quite greedily. And and we didn't pass that point in our relationship. But I'm just talking about even butterflies in a friendship. She didn't want me to have new, like, oh my god, I got a girl crush, I have a new friend. That Even just a strictly platonic friend. She wanted me to have no happiness she wanted to suck all of my happiness, take it and give it to the person that was making her happy, whatever happy is for a narcissist, it is relative, but she suck it and take it to the new supply. And she wanted me to have nothing, just stay by your my side in misery as I treat you debaucherously and love it. <laughs> What's not to love? Me sabotaging every trip, me not me not cooperating with you. And what it did do was it made me hyper aware. And that's why sometimes you have to go through those dark nights with these really ridiculous people. I know if someone's meeting my needs or not at this point. I also know what my needs are and I'm not afraid to say it. I also know that I deserve everything I want. You know, you guys have heard me talk about the fact that my spouse is a homebody in this suite, in this moment today. Um, my spouse doesn't want to travel. It's not a thing in his soul at all. He doesn't have wanderlust. Uh, if we go see his family, you know, once or twice a year, and that is above and beyond for him, and he's delighted. Even when we're up there, he won't, like, take me out to, like, the locally touristy things that would, you know, every town has a, like, oh, you gotta go see this, you gotta go do that, right? And I remember going up there with um, that ex, specifically, and she and I went and did things <laughs> um, that I would have loved to have done with my husband, but he wouldn't do that with me. That doesn't mean he's evil, guys. This is not, this is not a therapy session, but what I'm telling you is that I decided I was gonna live my life. And I decided, okay, he's not going to travel with me. He doesn't think I'm capable of it. He told me at one point, you're not going to go do this and that. He told me I wouldn't go to places that I have, in fact, been to out of the country. Um, but he didn't believe in me in that way. And in his own way, he had his own Capricorn fears of wanting me to stay right by his side. And that makes him feel safer. But the reason we're placed into people's lives is not just to be like-minded. It's to bring them challenges. The challenge for me in loving him was grounding myself and sitting still because I could run everywhere and being with him was very good for me, for my career, because I was able to really focus there. The challenge for me being with him is that he has to learn how to let a butterfly fly free and not want to pin my wings and keep me right up underneath him. It is not a coincidence that I have the personality type that I have and that he has his that's what a good relationship will do. You don't have to be identical for love to come through or for lessons to come through. You are supposed to bring each other and elevate. That's what relationships do. And so for him, would it be easier to hold on to me super, super tight? Yes. But would my dreams come true? No. And my dream is travel. And so they said, off you go. And they sent in fairies. It's my fairy season. They sent in people that wanted to fly too, that wanted to go and that wanted to do. And I always ask husband, would you like to? And the answer is, you guessed it, no. Don't, I can't internalize that. I'm not sad about it at all anymore, but I used to be. And then I realized, well, I have a whole life. 
So I'm going to travel and be free. And I'll come back to home base, which is a good feeling. But I'm going to have beautiful new memories and moments and meals. And there is no ceiling. Someone needs to hear that today. Whether it's a friendship, whether it's a family member, whether it's a spouse, a lover, whatever. You do not have to be the exact same way that your person is. They are dispatched to you to help for different things. I watched, I binge watched a thing this weekend that uh, my friend picked out. It was fabulous. And there was this, um, I mean, like, absolutely fabulous. She picks out the best programming. It's the craziest thing. We go into all these incredible portals of spirituality. I freaking love it. And it was amazing. And there was a moment where the the protagonists in the show are having a fight about compatibility in a relationship. And their similarities were no longer similarizing <laughs> not a word and they were realizing like their area of differences but i realized why they were together and i'm talking to my friend about it i'm like you see that this is happening and this is happening because this is happening and this is happening but i could see that his logic was needed to balance some of her otherworldly wildness and his otherworldly wildness needed to be balanced by her logic very interesting a little message there about compatibility and partnerships definitely you want to have some things in common but everything is not always going to fit and it's not supposed to my husband needed to experience me to have the challenge of what it's like to set a butterfly free and trust that it will come home if that's how it is supposed to be because that's his insecurity and so in my own way i took his hand when we got together figuratively speaking and said Let's go. Are you ready? It was a wild ride, a crush through crowds, and for him, what felt like debauchery. Just sit down. I'm not like the other in-laws and the other sister-in-laws and wives. Family is not my focus. I don't have kids. I don't have their life, and they can't shame me into it. That's not who I was destined to be, and that was not what he was supposed to experience being with me. It was supposed to be something altogether different to fulfill our destinies. But that doesn't mean that I had to forfeit what feels like some of the best parts of me, which is those moments when I get to flit and fly and be free. He had to work on acceptance and he had to work on understanding that he made a choice too. Sometimes we're in relationships with people. Free will is the order of our human condition. They don't have to be like you, go with you and do like you. They get to decide. But you don't suppress what you are and what you want to keep someone else happy because you will resent that. You will resent them and you will regret it. And that's where bitterness can creep in. A meandering way we went there, but maybe, again, something that someone needed to hear. Equally yoked is an interesting thing. And now when I think about it, I think about it more spiritually. I like my soul tribe to have similarities like me. But even in my soul tribe, I am challenged with new forms of connection, new forms of communication, new forms of um, understanding. Even the people that are dispatched to me and that I'm dispatched to, we are bringing different vibrations and energies to one another. Because we all, amongst ourselves, have work to do. Everything is not just a perfect fit. Sometimes there will be a little bit of grit, like sandpaper, to slough off those rough edges. And that's okay. But being abused, being neglected is never the way. And it's never a way that you will live again. And it's never anything that you should accept, my friend. You deserve all of the kisses, all of the hugs. From the universe, I mean, specifically. I'm not talking about your lover or friends. I'm talking about the little ways that the universe will put up those 777s. Seven, seven, and the way that a stranger will say something that you were just reading in your meditation or listening to on a YouTube station. Those are the kisses and the hugs that I had been craving. And those are the ways that I've been receiving the most incredible validation without lifting a finger or asking for it. The hand out from the universe. Are you ready? Let's go. You'll get through the worst of whatever it is that was hard for you to understand, grasp, and know. You will come out to the other side 
you will get to the place where I am, where I don't want to burn down <laughs> my ex. I realized she played probably one of the most important roles in my life. Not, not to give her so much credit, but she was lazy AF. She didn't mean to do it on purpose. She And she certainly didn't want it to turn out this way. But we are magicians, my sweet empaths, the great transmuters of pain. And she gave me such incredible, rich fertilizer to work with. <laughs> and I've turned it into some of the absolute best shit. That part. Love you guys. So good sharing energy with you. Look for that hand. They're extending it to you. They want to know if you're ready. And if you are, then your angels say in a great chorus, let's go. But let's go far. Come back and join me next time, guys. We'll continue to evolve together.